Hello. Hello, Tim. How are you? Long time no see. I love it. Say that again so I can learn it. Ombai? Ombai. Ombai. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you do so everybody knows who you are. And let's start there. Okay. Hi, I'm Kara Jean of Taking Care of Business. I'm an executive coach and the Kara Method is my name and my framework. So I do clarify, assess, realign, and achieve. It's exactly the same as everything you've seen out there, just a little bit different because most of us are pretty much the same in completely different kind of ways. And I like to navigate that space. That's what I do. Okay. So uh, first one is, what are your most significant challenges that you face in transforming workplace culture and leadership within your organization or those of your clients? Universally, the biggest struggle is l helping people recognize that what they have to do is handle this hot mess before they can do anything with that hot mess. So it doesn't matter how much you think someone else is responsible for the culture or the changes you need to have happen. If you actually want to gain traction, it starts with yourself. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I like that. They're both true. You just choose the one that serves you best. Yep. Yes. I think that that is what I have discovered is it's all exactly the same in a different way. I mean, that really, really, really is true universally, whether it is mindset or tools or skill sets, you need them all. And the perspective changes everything. One size fits all. I have the solution to everything. Coaches are not coaches. They're a little delusional. I would, I would, I would say they're amazing trainers, they're amazing consultants, they anybody who has a really clear idea of the path that they can take you down. That's amazing. But mm -hmm. you're 100% right, that's not coaching in in the real in my opinion. The mm -hmm. signs of a real coach is that they genuinely believe that you need to ask an expert for advice on your business and the best expert for advice for your business uh, so the next question is, uh, could you describe a recent situation where you felt that um, your leadership team or the leadership team of your clients could have benefited from additional training guidance in cult, uh, training or guidance in culture building, leadership, or both? Um, yes. And the answer is all of the time. One of the things that I value the most and that I am able to deliver with my, with my people is that it's never just me that you can bring me on and I'm going to bring you all of the skills, tools, the BS, the belief systems that I think work and you may do with them what you want. But I'm going to say it in a way that's going to hit probably if we're really lucky, a third to a half of people's brains, because I might not say it in the way or with the words that somebody else needs to hear. I have found that having no less than three people deliver essentially the same message, but in completely different ways is the best way for it to land. To that, when I work with big corporations, I have partnered with a marketing uh, diva and a HR consultant. We do so much of the same things, but so completely differently that we can share the same concept, but provide it from these different perspectives. So you'll actually get to hear what you need to hear to be able to succeed. Yeah, I like that. That's one thing I'm always open to. And I'm actually surprised how many people are not. How are you making that assessment? Sure. Right. Yeah. And I think in my experience, another per so same concept, another perspective, right? So many of us have had really devastating collaborations where you go in to work with somebody because you genuinely believe that you're both going to provide value. And then that does not happen. And it can stunt your ability to collaborate in a healthy way in any forward momentum. I know that now because of the women that I work with as collaborators, as part of this team, because it was really hard for us to sit down and have that conversation. We all went through a really bad collaborative choice within months of each other. So when we came together, we were like, I mean, 
let's try it. I don't, I'm not committed though. Like, I just want to see how this is going to play. And then the 45 minutes, they were like, okay. And then next, and what we could do is, and yeah, oh my God, you're so good at that. Yeah. What I'd love is for me that again. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, that that's where you want to get to. It's in the classroom that I learned about psychological safety and growth mindset. I didn't know what they were yet, but I didn't need to know because I could see that it it just made sense. And when you have a, an environment where you get immediate feedback, the kids, the adults, the toddlers, they either respond in a way that shows you're going in the right direction or not. And so, yeah. That's I love that you work with kids. Working with kids, I mean, okay, so you make better money when you work with adults, but boy, kids get it so much faster than we do. You provide information once and a kid's like, that makes sense. I connected to this. Let's do it. And you tell an adult, you're like, here it is. And they're like, uh, and you're like, here it is again. They're like, oh, okay, maybe. Yeah. And then here it is again. Ow. The other thing is, if we could transplant the attitude of a two year old in adults, they would overnight, because really it's a mindset thing in a lot of ways, they would overnight become remarkable geniuses. And they'd say, I can't even believe I had that potential. It's like, yeah, but because you had all the the you mental always- garbage in the way that serves you in no way whatsoever. Okay, so let's do the next one. So this is, uh, what specific outcomes would you hope to achieve through training in leadership and culture building? My all the time goal is to develop support and a culture of recognizing the humanity in humans. I think that that is foundational. Uh, I do a lot of accountability and emotional intelligence, but I would say a step even before that is developing that curiosity, sort of what you were just talking about with the fixed versus growth mindset, right? The desire to say, but what if? Because if you can do that, all the doors open. And the options are endless. Well, the next one is, in your opinion, what are the key skills and competencies that leaders should possess to create a thriving organizational culture? Key skills and tools that leaders should have to create a healthy work culture. Good gravy. That's a large list. But I would say it starts with well, so in my language, I, I say the BAMs of energy, the bare ass minimums for taking care of this meat soup and the hormone soup that lets mush management do its job. I think that that is the very, very, very first base step, what I have discovered in leaders. And I'm pretty sure across the board now, that's a pretty ballsy statement, but I'm going to say it anyway. Across the board, the first thing that gets set down when we are taking more on is ourself. And I think that is part of what perpetuates these uncomfortable cultures out in the workforce is that we have leaders that are pouring from empty vessels and shockingly enough, leaving their team thirsty. I like that. Healthy, healthy body, healthy mind, or vice versa, is absolutely true. So, yes, yeah, people I'm, neglect themselves. That is one of the greatest hacks that I give people um, around to help them conceptualize the reality of this, right? Because yeah, what you said is exactly true. If you do not take care of your meat suit, you will not have the hormone soup that allows mush management to do its job period. And case in point, when you get stuck, when you're working on a project, you're creating a new lead magnet, you're uh, prepping a proposal to the boss, you're getting ready to uh, share information downline, whatever it is, and you get stuck in your head. If you get up and literally just shake, I mean, like, (laughs) your body out, Mm -hmm. that movement of your muscles triggers the creation of a protein that feeds your brain and that activity two minutes of shaking it out will jump start your brain's ability to find that next solution i was like oh no no that's better that's better perfect Replace. yeah i love that you called him them a teacher Bam. what i learned in teaching is the students teach me as much if not consistently more than anything i'm going to provide to them Mm -hmm. there's a saying in japanese literally to teach is to learn what exactly is the difference between look see and watch and if you've never been asked that question it's like hold on i have to examine 
I know how to use them correctly, <laughs> but I don't know why when but they're used great. in a different way, they're incorrect, yeah. right? Let's do another one. Even, even easier, theoretically. I want you to write me a document, please. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to use a document without pictures to describe how to tie your shoes. Mm -hmm. Think mm -hmm. how long that document has to be without the benefit of pictures. Suddenly, this truly easy thing to do is like, hold on, what steps? How do we describe this even, right? So it's the same kind of thing. So the next question here is, what do you think is the ideal duration for a comprehensive course on transforming workplace culture, leadership, or both? No one likes this answer, but this is my real answer. It has to be a year and it has to be repeatable. A culture is not something you go, it's not a one and done. It is a realignment and a realignment and a realignment. I do believe that you can do a course, let's say even a one day one, if you go and apply it and then do it again several months later to re-remember the things that you forgot and then go and apply it so that you can do it again and re that's the thing. You're going to learn new levels every time you do that and culture is something you have to unpack all the time every day. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a cultural course, I think it has to be an entire year program that you can then repeat as new people come on. I do yeah. think that you can teach a leader's micro coaching or sh some of those skills that will, that itself, those skills, those tools is a completely different conversation because you can use tools to impact culture and learning a tool can be anywhere from three weeks to six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear you there. Next one. Uh, what factors would uh, what factors would influence your decision? So this loops back to the question I just asked. So you said a year, but in sort of a more intense way and for specific tools, you talked about shorter term courses. So if you haven't already answered it there, and I suspect you have, what factors or what other factors would influence your decision about this ideal duration? It depends for me almost entirely on commitment at every level. So things that you are willing to develop at every level tend to have a longer running impact because everybody mm -hmm. understands the same kind. It's sort of like shooting an arrow from the guest all the way into the corporate CEO office, right? Boom, we just nailed it all the way through, easy pass. When nice. I get hired by, and this has happened, I've had to fire three times, um, bosses because I I am here not for and if you want me to come in to teach your team how to be better uh, my guess is probably there's some gaps in your understanding and if you're not willing to participate in that growth and development I'm not willing to do your work for you so yeah. those are much longer uh, commitments, much more expensive commitments. If I have to play the part of CEO because the CEO doesn't want to be in the room, valid but expensive. If you're hardcore strict, but anything beyond that, anybody who offers anything less than a one year guarantee isn't really that serious or really isn't that confident about the results they can deliver. I think that's really what it is balancing what you are confident you can deliver. For example, I do a 15 minute clarity session. I did mm -hmm. them originally as part of uh, development when I was in operations management and when I was in executive management, I then used it as like my part of my funnel for coaching. Like here's this cute value give. And I realized after four years of doing it that I had had a challenge on the table. If you can bring me a roadblock and it was originally a business one, then it became literally anything in your life, your existence with your kids, kids, with your family, with your work, whatever it was. If you can bring me a roadblock that takes longer than 20 minutes to get resourceful and make a plan of actions to move forward from, I'll gift you 45 more minutes. So you commit 15. And if I can't help you get to where you need to get by the end of 20 minutes, I'm going to give you 43 times that. Nice. I get it. And return on investment. Here you go. Right. Right. I like that. Uh, I might I might steal that. And, and I'm saying this publicly. This is where I got it. I got it from Kara. OK, so um, let's 
uh, let, let's pause for a sec because I want to go down the path you were talking about operations management. So can you can you tell me a little bit more about Kara before Kara, the Genki coach? Yes, um, I, this is fun because I've just been doing a deep dive with one of my coaches on my timeline. So this has been really fun. I took my first dual certification course when I was eight years old. I have been groomed for leadership literally my entire life. My first management, full-time paid management position, I had a team of five and I was running a burger stand in Mexico. So not only was I 15 and in charge of five other people my age or older, uh, I was also in charge of the product of tracking the counts of running the till. And in a, in a language that was my second language, I, I was still pretty fresh to living in the country and well i learned really quick i learned food really fast <laughs> i bet yeah uh, so i have been over 25 years in operations management and uh, a better part of a decade doing uh, development for operations up to C-suite and in that space, creating training programs within, within a company. I was creating training programs so that when we onboarded new managers, we could get them all to the same place. If we were promoting from within, we could get them to the same place. And we had trackable metrics for each of the levels that we needed. So I've been doing it a really long time. The biggest problem I found as an operations manager is the corporate standard of hour long one-on-ones. And this is fascinating, uh, post pandemic. So in 2022, they did a big study on businesses and asked a whole bunch of them about development. 83% of businesses know that the fastest path forward is to implement development at every level of the business. Some of those businesses have actually implanted development at every level. And I think from my point of view, one of the big gaps is development is centered in the corporate world around these hour long one on ones. Well, as an operations manager who had over 100 employees, if I'm doing hour long one on ones with each of them and running a business, that's a quarterly review. And if you are developing your people during a quarterly review, that is gross. Please stop. Nobody wins. So yeah. I came up with this clarity session, this 15 minute session. And then as I went through, I got, uh, I got put in, I was able to add in emotional intelligence because I got emotionally intelligent certified. And then I was able to add in the coaching when I got certified as a coach. And now I have this system that I use a standalone uh, micro or laser coaching is the, I think the term for those kind of coaching. So I can do it as standalone coaching. I can teach it to other leaders so that they can gain back 45 minutes out of every hour and actually be able to develop all, rather than just wasting everybody's time. What formats or delivery methods would be most effective considering your schedule and learning preferences? I'm gonna to add to that or those of your clients. Okay, let me see if I understand the question. The question is on delivery of training and what aspects are important in my opinion. Right. Let me let me reiterate the 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 core of that because it is a little too long in my my own mind. So formats. So what formats or delivery methods would be most effective in the context of of your schedule or the schedule you were talking about a moment ago? Right. Like, you know, how much time do they have? Should it be something that's split into slivers? What do you think is the most effective way to to deliver that kind of thing, formats and delivery methods? I think that is a really deep question that doesn't have an easy answer. But I think simply it comes down to knowing what you're delivering and where. So if you are delivering development at an operations level, it has to be something you can do side by side while still doing the job because the job of operations is keeping the machine going and they cannot stop to develop. They need to be able to develop as they go. Whereas if you are working with the CEO and COO and the CFO, being able to clear a schedule and take a half day to really dive deep into a school a skill, a tool or a mindset that's going to help shift things and create alignment within the company is absolutely a reasonable expectation. So it depends 
entirely on what you are teaching and why you are teaching it. The only thing that I would say is universal in all areas of of delivering information is being able to do it in multiple modalities so that you can show, you can tell, and you can have them that way. Any type of learning style gets an opportunity to absorb some of the information. Yeah, um, it's interesting because what you were talking about is sort of like operations. It's like, well, of course, it's in the word. They have to be able to do it while operating. And, and sort of my own approach to that too is, it should sort of be ongoing all the time, virtually always available. That includes just more of a, uh, a mentor component with other people in the company. So there, there's a lot of things, but yeah, learning something, uh, an, an intensive has very good uses and you should obviously practice while you're there when the people around you are in the same training cohort and not just keep you accountable, but help you and you help them because that's when it really matters right when you're actually doing your work rather than we're going to do this training and then everybody goes back and and there's lots of research on that too it's like everybody goes back and they do nothing that they've just been trained on they do everything exactly the way they've done it for the last 10 years because after all that's the way it's done it's the way it's been <laughs> okay and it, Next. knowledge is power but it is not transformation. I can deliver you. Let's say I had the magic handbook of life and I could literally just read it to you and provide you all of the knowledge that would achieve everything you want. That's cool. You now have the knowledge, but you have not necessarily retained it to be able to use it. That's not how that works. We have not quite gotten to the matrix yet. <laughs> so well, it works ask... so with DE and I, so diversity, equity, and inclusion in the States. That mm -hmm. is the ongoing challenge is that upper leadership wants alternative perspectives. They know mm -hmm. how valuable that is. Right. The nail that stands out gets beat down and we have to unwrite that behavior and learn the mediation and moderation and the controversy tools so that when somebody gives a perspective that's not the one we were expecting that sticks out like a big nail, you don't just have to pound it down. You can be like, oh, no, I see how that works. Let's talk about it. Right. There's been some research to show that 90% of the time, diversity will outperform experts in their area of expertise. Diversity outperformed the specialized group 90% of the time Not fascinating. at what they're at, at what they're best at yeah, than they're, anyone yeah. else in the group. Of course, by definition, then they're also probably very narrow in their diversity. So diversity wins over pure yes. intelligence or specialization 90% of the time. And you're right. It's sort of like, we want this, uh, but only if we get answers we like it happens to be younger than you and you're already rejecting it. So you've kind of made your own point. And she was sort of like, yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah, but we're still not going to do it. That's the thing, right? You can't control it. There's just not enough duct tape. But that brings us sort of full circle in our conversation. It goes all the way back to the very first thing we were talking about and how your brain functions. And if you don't lift up your curiosity, start there before you even work on accountability, before you unpack the emotional intelligence and management, before you start working with it starts with your desire to be curious and learn from other people. Yeah, you can't uh, you can't change somebody who's already decided not to be changed, regardless of the tools. Fantastic book if you haven't read it uh, by Andrew Nilek. It's it's called You Can't Coach a Vampire Not to Bite. It, it's sort of like a dark. I, I love the title. It's sort of like a dark and backhanded version of Of course, I stung you. I'm a scorpion. It's in my nature. And we have to wrap it up today. We can always come back and do more, but I have a client in four minutes. Okay, let's try to fire off. We're not going to get them all done, but okay. I think it's better to answer them well than fast. The next one is when it comes to investing in leadership and culture development, what criteria do you consider when determining the value of a course? Verbals is always my answer there. Some of the statistics that I use when working on course and creating those with the teams is that the average new hire costs 35 to $40,000 
500 to $40,000. And that statistic comes from it costs about 3500 to get through sort of the onboarding and the time it takes to interview and all of that counted in. And then it up to 40,000 because when you bring someone new onto the team, the entire team's productivity drops as mm -hmm. we work together to build that back up, right? Mm -hmm. And that can cause massive ripples across an organization. So you can invest $3,500 to retain someone or to hire someone new. And if you're mm -hmm. using it to retain, all that happens is that person lifts up and then they lift a piece of people around them. So it's a growth space versus mm -hmm. watching that sink so you can come back up if you are spending it on hiring versus investing in development. Right. I'll give you a little, uh statistic related to that. And I think it came from Gallup, but it's basically estimated that to replace an experienced worker, an experienced worker specifically, you can estimate that it will cost six months to a year of their regular wages to replace them when you lose them, which is why things like culture building is, if all you are is greedy, you should still be doing culture building, even if you don't care about people, it, it pays. Yes. So let's leave it here, but thank you. It was a real pleasure. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for your understanding. I'm here. So Kara, what question or questions do you think we should be asking ourselves about transforming workplace culture and leadership? Oh, I love that question. Uh, so interestingly enough, this actually just came up. And I have a standard answer for it now. So if you want to be the best impact to your company culture, the first question you need to ask is how can I impact this? What can I do? What part of this is, the, is something that I have control over? And you have to look at the way you're thinking about things, the way you're speaking about things, and the way you are behaving about things. And you have to address that before you can even look at, okay, now what can anybody else do? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So let me ask you that again, because I want to know something very specific. You said speaking, behaving or what? Thinking. Oh, excellent. So I think that there are in in my reality, what I have discovered is that there are really only two things in life. There are the things that you have control over and the things you do not have control over. And if you let yeah. go of the things that you have no control over, there are only three things. The way you think the way you speak and the way you behave. And the more you can get alignment in that, the more you have power, control, and impact in every second of your life. Damn, I love that. And 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 it's so true, right? Like this is where neuroscience loops back around to Buddhism. And believe it or not, Buddhist monks are pretty good buddies with neuroscientists for reasons you might not expect, but it's essentially because they've had two and a half thousand years practice at how they engage their mind and mm -hmm. how they control their brain. And there's things that they can do, uh, really proficient um, meditators that few other people on earth can do. But it's about that. It was sort of like, you know, letting go of something you can't control over, uh, letting go of, uh, you know, losses in your family and loved ones. It's like those who you love who have, have passed on, Regardless of your belief about that, if you spend your time focusing on, I've lost them, I've lost them, I've lost them, which is especially the mindset, the thinking piece, it was like, I lost them. The main thing that came up for me when that happened, which made me a better human being was, I often think, and this was a long time ago now, I often think, would they be proud of me? Yeah. What would they think about this? And I don't believe that they are conscious on the other side. I don't think there is another side, but, it, and I want to be wrong. It's like, I would really love to see them again. If I could, then I can talk to them about that, but it matters. I think that's where ancestor worship actually comes from, right? Is when you lose somebody close, it's sort of like, you're not finished having conversations with them necessarily. You're not right. thinking about what, how would they, like I said, how would they think about me behaving in a certain way? So that's when you got mindset, uh, as you said, behaving and what you're saying about it. And that affects everybody. And people cannot see in your brain, 
but they can certainly see the effects. Yes. Yeah. We judge ourselves by intent because we know what we meant by that, but we judge others by behavior because that's what we see. So guess what everybody's judging us by. Right. And whether, whether it's completely by coincidence or something else, I had recently heard that in a book i don't know whether you recommended it but exactly that it was like i thought that was so brilliant and that's the same kind of thing the same kind of insights that come from buddhism but people mistake as being oh that means it's all mystical it's like or it's just we can't see people's thoughts and therefore we we have we base it on you could be the finest human being in the world but if you're an asshole boss it's not going to matter to your employees and that's going to affect obviously all your leadership and all your results. So right. then based on what I've just said, ideally, how often should that support that on-demand support be available? And now we're talking about the frequency of said support to catch something from falling between the cracks. I believe every single human on the planet would benefit from quarterly I mean, that's why businesses do quarterly reviews for that reason. Right. If you are not reassessing what's going on and what could be better at minimum on a quarterly level, well, are you doing anything? Right. So, and and I'm just going to, just going to challenge you only on this. And that is absolutely yeah. quarterly. Quarterly to me seems shamefully infrequent, but the point yeah. is, remember this, this isn't just the standard, uh, the standard training, but this is the days, the weeks, the months in between the leadership or culture building training where somebody needs that is your answer. And, you know, I'm not going to answer for you. I just want to make sure that it's the difference that this is separate from the training. This is like the, the 1-800 number or the, the help number or the outreach beyond the standard training where the leader might say, you know, I don't really want to say to anybody on my team which means they need to work on their psychological safety. I don't want to say any, uh, to anybody on my team, I'm the leader, but I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I don't know the answer. The problem exists. I don't know the answer. I need help with this, whether it be the leadership training, the culture building. It was like, I don't know. Who do I go to? Like I said, between the cracks of the standard training. So the for me, the clarity sessions are designed to be weekly. What... I believe is any time you run into any of those, any time where you are hesitant, uncertain, questioning, whether it's your ability, your team's ability, whatever it is, that is a point to reach out to somebody. And it doesn't have to be me or the coach that you hired, but somebody. It is time to start saying those things out loud. So I would go to the point of every day you ought to have somebody that you can throw the things that came up that day at and see what mm -hmm. sticks because it's better with a bite. I like that alliteration. And you know, that's it. That's the reason I put in the original question on demand. It was like, so like, when do you watch Netflix when you want, or you don't, nobody needs Netflix, but when you want, <laughs> When you got to yeah. when you got to catch uh, the new season of an enchant is season of Enchanted, mm -hmm. which is on now, you just hit the button and it's there as mm -hmm. needed. So yeah, good, good. Okay, so then the third part to this question is: now that we've talked about the ideal, it should be seven twenty four, no matter what time zone you're in. Two, realistically, how often would it be practical and sustainable? That is, yeah. Um, so I think for upper leadership, I think it is realistic to expect a once a week from their support team. So anybody above them or parallel with them. I firmly believe that operations, if you are not touching every single person on your team every single day, people are falling through the cracks. Things are falling through the cracks, period. I'm not saying you have to do hour long one on ones. In fact, I am incredibly anti hour long one on ones with anybody at operations because we all got stuff to do. <laughs> but I think that if you're not at least checking in and making contact with every day, you're not going to know. Mm -hmm. And I love and agree with that. It's sort of like it could just be realistically again, it's like, Kara, how you doing? Is everything good today? Yeah, it's good. Okay, that's it. That's 
Um, especially because, you know, me being this sciencey, everything is empirically derived thing. It's like, yeah, if you don't need it, fine. But the cool. fact that somebody asked you the question is what matters. Okay, great. Next one. So how do you envision the course that is what we've described above in the in the rest of this interview, helping you address specific cultural or leadership challenges within your organization or those of your clients? And now I have to remember what we addressed earlier. So for me, I my leadership course teaches my clarity session and the fundamentals behind it. So the idea is to eliminate all hour long one-on-ones entirely and be able to go up to somebody and say, what can I support you with today? And have a process if they have an answer to have a process in place that takes less than 15 minutes so that they feel helped, heard, seen, and valued, and they can move on so that everybody can move on. And I like that. So you're saying we want to hone the process so that it becomes perhaps as we just talked about as little as seconds to say it's all good or yes i need this and by this time because of the previous training they know how to minimize that to the the least amount of time to get those maximum results okay next one is considering the potential impact on your organization what pricing model one time monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, yearly, blah, 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 subscription, whatever you want to call it, would you find most appealing for the training that we've talked about? Yeah, that's been described thus far. So what what sort of pricing model do you think would be, makes the most sense to you considering the potential impact, again, on your organization or your client organization? I think I understand the question correctly. So Uh, Is it explaining the pricing model or why I attach it to that level? So considering the potential impact on your organization, what pricing model, let's say, appeals to you or would you think is sort of the best way to go? So I'll... I'll say that I have, I myself have three price points there. And I believe that coaching sort of falls into this in general. Uh, So I have the, the the clarity sessions themselves are in the hundred dollar range because they are quick, they are fast, they are effective, and they are accessible to anyone. That is the intent of them. Now to learn to do that is a much higher level skill. So that's in the thousand zone, but it is still Mm -hmm. training a tool. And I Mm -hmm. don't believe that tools need to be any more than thousands. Um, However, one-on-one coaching, my failure expert, my big one-year course, that is Mm -hmm. in the tens of thousands zone because that is going to impact hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I believe that is worth tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. So that's about the price point, but, and that, that's good. I like that. And I like the way you categorized it. So what would you say is the pricing model? So let's jump back, not the pricing numbers, but the pricing model. So the first one then is on demand and low cost. The second yeah. one is? The second one is a practice of a tool and it would be in the mid zone. And right. then exclusive content specific to an individual is in the, te- is in the high zone. Okay. And, and sort of let's, let's loop back then onto the frequency. So let's start at the high and go backwards now. So the, the one-to-one one year coaching, presumably that pricing model would be a one-time, is that a one-time or a monthly payment to do that? Given the, the language, I think it would be, you pay this, that's a year, we're done. Yes. Although I think it is really important to allow for payment options. Uh, Mm -hmm. So a one-time fee, I like the idea that if somebody's going to pay for the entire year up front, that they get a special deal just for choosing that, for making that commitment. I think that also sometimes those funds are not liquid and capable and able, right? So being able to do quarterly I think is really important to allow that for people, but I do believe it costs more. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. I agree. So then that was the top end model. So uh, what was the the second one then? That was uh, skill Both the mid building. and the low are a pay up front. Like this is, you're paying for this tool and I am now going to teach you how to use this tool. 
money. Okay, so the next one is, and this one is may or may not be shared, but I'll start with it anyway. So who do you know who could benefit from or be willing to be interviewed by me on this specific topic? That is, take this interview with me. So many things come to mind too quickly. I think immediately I would uh, I would share my friend Mara Harina. So she does burnout stuff and works mm-hmm. with a lot of leadership in that capacity. And so I think she would have brilliant answers to this. And actually her brother, Arkai, would be amazing too. He does marketing and branding. So he works with a lot of different leaders. And they have a unique perspective on how they do things, which I think will fit with your internet. It is important. I have one more too. So I have three people I will connect you with. Uh, The other one is also an HR uh, consultant and coach who practices Buddhism. So I thought you might enjoy that. That would be really, that would be a good one. Yes. Okay. I'll have three people to connect you with. Brilliant. Yes. Um, No, it was incredible. I had, well, I mean, if it had not been fun, I would not have come back for the second half. Right. There you go. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you already you already pinpointed exactly where the area of growth is, which is honing those questions and getting them smaller, shorter, and easier to ask what it is that you are looking for. Tim, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. The movie Inception. It's like, oh, you like movies? Cool. What's your favorite movie? Inception is like, this might seem crazy. But I know you're a law student, so I know you're smart. I'm going to I'm going to tell you about this if you're interested. So it's like, yeah, OK. And it was like they now it was actually a, a university, a university of Kyoto or, or Kyoto telecommunications, blah, 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 institution. You can now using a baseline that is OK. They take you. They put you in a in a MRI scanner. They take you. They say, OK, now I'm going to show you a picture of a man, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever. I'm going to show you a picture of a dog, a train, a car, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you about something, play some sounds for you. And they basically look at your brain profile. What they're doing is it's they let you sleep, I believe, actually in an MRI, right? So then it's it, it gets really weird here. This is inception level, which is why I shared this randomly with this gal because you've seen your significant other there's specific fingerprint of brain activity associated with that because you've seen that train because you've seen that car and it was fun because i went because of the actual neuroscience of sleep which we know more and more about that is that REM sleep is about making it it's it's basically taking distant concepts it seems to be a nighttime therapist that is extracting emotions from experiences. So if the experiences are really negative, that we don't have to relive possibly the trauma of the experience, but we can maintain the knowledge to then prevent the trauma in the future, right? If it was a terrible experience or a life-threatening one, it's like, don't pet the bear. Right. Bears look cute, but they're Hmm, really dangerous. But not, yeah. Yeah, don't pet them. Right. And yeah, if you can't, if you can't separate those, that is one, at least by this theory of one of the origins, perhaps of PTSD, is that when they relive the experience, because their brain via REM sleep has not been able to separate those two pieces, every time they have that experience, those emotions are still fully attached. So it's like they relive not just the knowledge, but the trauma to Mm -hmm. your brain literally seems to seek out and specifically in REM sleep the connection between this idea and this idea that seem completely irrelevant that is creativity Mm -hmm. and novel knowledge and generalization and then the third one was of course I can't remember it because I'm talking about brain and memory but the gist is there's remarkable and specific things about REM sleep versus NREM or non-REM sleep While this whole experience is going on, though, by and large, your REM sleep is associated with the learning and experiences you had that day. So we've got your fingerprint, you have a dream, and we can say, oh, well, you saw a man, a woman, you saw somebody you care about deeply that we don't know exactly who it is because we already had your fingerprint. So no kidding, they are not at the level of being able to put on a screen your dream, but they are at the level with that baseline 
of saying, oh, well, this dream was very visual and, and you were looking around a lot because they could see your motor cortex activity of looking around. It's like, right. uh, I don't know, maybe you were watching. We also gave you a, 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 a training or a baseline that included watching fireworks. I think maybe you were watching fireworks in your dream and like literally so general content and that is no shit is something that has yeah. already happened. So it's not inception level, but it's, right, right, I can tell right. you the content. We're you were, right. there was a lot of listening. So maybe you were at a concert. You, uh, you experienced what seems like uh, love or attraction in the dream, given your orientation. It is your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. You had, you had a dream which included feelings of attraction and maybe a romantic dream. They can tell at that level today. It's called Why We Sleep, and you'll learn more about sleep and why, how it integrates into what you already do. It's sort of yeah. like we all really need to go on this mission that people should be setting a go to sleep alarm. They should try yeah. to stay on the same sleep schedule, the sleep because, hygiene. Oh, yeah, because it does amazing things for your brain. Yeah. Right. And and more than you can ever imagine, put it this way, as he put it, you know, within within the requirements that you need, the more you sleep, the longer you live. So if you want to live longer, get your shit together with respect to your sleep. Okay. It's been Thank a you. delight. Again, more I will send thing. that to you. I and I will have the connection emails by end of day or connection LinkedIn ones by end of day. Tomo arigato gozaimashita. Bye-bye. Bye, Karen.